Hi, Dr. H here. This video will be the review of the entire communication unit. Uh, first, we started with communication on a cellular basis. Um, the few different ways that cells can communicate with each other. Uh, one way is through actual direct contact with each other, whether these cells um, are in direct physical contact uh, with the gap junctions as we see in animal cells um, or through cell-cell uh, recognition um, and that we will see again uh, coming up in the immune system uh, once we get to that point. Uh, cells that are just not directly touching each other but are just close to each other can also communicate um, and this is known as local signaling. Uh, the paracrine signaling uh, is used in, again, in the immune system uh, to activate different cells, and we will again see that. And then the synaptic signaling uh, is shown in the nervous system uh, when cells need to communicate across a very small area called a synapse. Uh, so these, again, local signaling, uh, cells that are not physically touching but are relatively co close to each other. Uh, the final type of cellular signaling that we have is the long distance signaling and this is seen in the uh, endocrine system with hormones. So in this case, the two cells that are communicating can be very far apart uh, on, on opposite sides of the body where the signaling molecule is released out into the bloodstream and tra can travel a very long distance to the target cell to elicit a response. Uh, and again, we will see that with uh, hormonal signaling. On the cellular side, there are three basic steps of cell communication, of cell signaling. Uh, they are, uh, step one is reception, step two, transduction, and step three, of course, is the response. So reception, uh, the receptor is a very specific protein that will bind to the signaling molecule. Uh, as shown here, the receptor is on the cell surface and the signaling molecule is on the outside of the cell. This is not always the case, of course. Some signaling molecules are able to enter into the cell uh, through the cell membrane. Uh, the second step is transduction, where that signal is transmitted from the receptor throughout the cell to uh, wherever the response will take place. Um, and then the response is, of course, a very specific response to the particular signaling molecule and whatever cell type is picking up the actual signal. Uh, looking a little bit closer at uh, transduction, this is step two. Uh, remember that these uh, transductions often happen in the signaling uh, transduction pathways. These, uh, this is an example of a protein phosphorylation cascade where you have multiple proteins involved in getting the message from the receptor down to the final uh, end response area. There's a couple reasons for this. Uh, one is having all of these uh, players here in this cascade will increase the strength of the signal because uh, they work as enzymes. So each molecule label will be able to activate a large number of its targets. Uh, and this, this multi-step pathway will also allow for multiple signals to come into the same pathway for the cell to be able to judge which response it should take. So looking a little bit uh, broader at some organism level uh, communications, uh, we talked about plant hormones. Uh, you certainly do not need to memorize any specific hormone, so I'm not even going to show that very long. Um, this is a very important uh, experiment here. This is uh, showing the first hormone to be identified in plants. This uh, what we call phototropism, the ability of a plant to bend toward a light source. So these data here are showing that it is some molecule that is produced in the tip in response to light, which travels down the stem of the plant and causes this modified growth pattern to allow the plant to bend to one side. Um, other things that light can do with plants, uh, it will control the germination, the sprouting of the seeds. 
Um, and this is mainly controlled by red light. So as we see when the control kept in the dark, there uh, very little germination. When the seeds are shown a red light, the seeds begin to germinate, they begin to sprout. And that response can be turned off by following that red wavelength with a far red wavelength, a little bit further down the spectrum. So this represents the receptor for the light, the phytochromes, shifting between the active and the inactive state. Right? Red light, in this case, makes the phytochrome active. Far red will shift the phytochrome back to the inactive state and will block the germination. Plant flowering is also controlled by this red, far red light, so it's uh, through the phytochrome receptors. But we have two different responses here to the red and far red lights, depending on whether the plant uh, normally flowers in the early spring or in the fall, which would be a long night plant, or if the flower normally uh, blooms in the summer, which would make it a short night plant. So again, the red and far red flashes will shift the phytochromes between active and in the inactive states. And whether that induces flowering or blocks flowering depends on whether it's a long night or a short night plant. So this can be a little bit confusing. Um, it does show up on the AP test sometimes. Just remember that red and far red shift the receptors between active and the inactive states. So you're basically resetting the timer that the plant has, counting how long the, uh, the dark period has been. Um, shifting over to animals and some hormones found in animals, specifically humans. Again, do not memorize the list. Uh, it's probably good to know a few of the uh, endocrine organs. You can probably name most of those. Uh, off the top of your head without having to really think too much about it. This is where all the hormones are produced. And remember that the action of hormones is a long distance from where the hormone is produced and secreted. Right? Hormonal signaling is long distance signaling. Hormones are, are created in one part of the body. They travel through the bloodstream to a target cell, which can be a very, very long distance away. And here we see a couple different examples, uh, one with a receptor on the cell surface and the other with the receptor inside the cell. Okay, they both function as hormones because they are traveling through the bloodstream and going all throughout the body. A uh, couple systems that we went into a little bit more detail with, uh, first off is the immune system. Uh, remember that there are the organs of the immune system um, the lymph nodes spread all throughout the body, um, and the spleen are the main organs. Uh, they are just big masses. The lymph nodes are just big masses of these immune cells, the lymphocytes and the macrophages. Looking at the immune system function, remember there are two branches of the immune system in general. There is the innate immunity and the acquired immunity. Uh, innate immunity, remember, is very, very rapid, uh, and it is nonspecific, so it will stop just about anything, but it's also relatively weak. Okay? It, doesn't, it will not get rid of all of the pathogen itself. Um, the innate immunity is broken down to both external defenses. These are the physical barri barriers, which will keep uh, the pathogens out of our body, things like skin. And there are also the internal uh, innate immunity defenses, uh, the phagocytic cells and the natural killer cells, which will go around and just remove any pathogen that they see without any sort of specificity. The acquired immune system is a little bit slower. Uh, it takes a little while to, to warm up, but it is very, very strong, and it is, of course, very specific. Okay, so it is targeting a specific, very specific pe uh, pathogen and can work very well to remove that pathogen almost completely. Um, and in the acquired immune response, there are, again, two branches, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, the humoral response, which involves antibodies, and then the cell-mediated response, which involves a couple different cell types. 
this is showing one uh, very important response in the innate immune system. This is the inflammatory response. Okay, when an invading pathogen comes in, there's a very uh, quick response uh, through local signaling. This is all through paracrine signaling. Uh, these molecules uh, are released and that causes uh, increased blood flow to the area and the capillaries become a little bit leaky and the, the phagocytic cells come out of the capillaries and move to the area of injury. And all of this is to help with wound healing. Okay, so this is, again, this is the inflammatory response and it's a very important arm of the innate immune system. Um, shifting over to the acquired immune system, uh, there are two major cell types involved. Those are the B cells and the T cells. Okay, just like all blood cells, remember these, these are types of white blood cells, just like all blood cells, they start their lives in the bone marrow with these lymphoid stem cells. And whether they develop into B cells or T cells depends on where they complete their maturation. Okay, if the lymphoid stem cell stays in the bone marrow and fully develops, then it is a B cell. If this uh, lymphoid stem cell leaves the bone marrow at a very early state and moves up into the thymus, then it becomes a T cell. And both of these cells will then go out into the bloodstream and help to help police the body looking for invading pathogens. Um, one very important aspect of the acquired immune system is the memory function. Both sides, the humoral side and the cell mediated side, have memory cells which stay in the body, uh, oftentimes for the for the remainder of your lives, and they can remember the pathogen and can respond much, much faster. So looking at the blue line here, we see that the first time uh, pathogen A comes in, the response is a little bit slower, a little bit weaker. Uh, the second time pa the pathogen comes in, the response is much faster and much stronger, so you are now immune to this infection. Right? You cannot be infected by the same thing twice because of these memory cells. Okay, so the, it, uh, the acquired immune system, uh, two arms, the humoral immune system uh, shown in orange there and the cell mediated system uh, over on the green side. Right in the middle, sitting right in the middle between these two sides are the very important cells, the helper T cells. Okay, these cells have a role in activating both sides. So if these cells are lost or are malfunctioning, uh, the entire immune system can break down. So these helper T cells shown here uh, can be activated uh, by these dendritic cells. These are cells whose job it is to find pathogens, break them down inside, and then present little pieces of them to the, on, on their cell surface. The helper T cell comes along, recognizes those as a foreign invading pathogen, and will activate either the cell-mediated cytotoxic T cell side or the humoral immunity, the, the B cells, to start doing their job. So this is the humoral immunity side. So here we have our helper T cell being activated. The helper T cell then goes and di makes direct contact with our B cell, right? So here we have our cellular communication on a very, very close uh, scale. These cells are actually making physical contact with each other. Um, and there's also a little bit of paracrine signaling there with the, the cytokines being released. So that activated B cell, then learns the, the pathogen, learns the antigen on the surface, and is activated to begin to divide. And that, that clonal expansion, it's called, uh, will make two types of cells. Uh, the plasma cells, the active plasma cells, will begin to secrete large amounts of antibodies out into the bloodstream. And these proteins will do a number of things to help clear out the invading pathogen. 
the other half of the uh, of the the clonal the B cell clones become the memory cells, and these cells again have the antibodies on the surface, but they stick around for a very long time in your body. And if this pathogen comes in again, or the antigen comes in again, those B cells are ready to divide and secrete their antibodies and clear it out before it can in, before it can mount a large infection and cause an illness. So that's the humoral side with the B cells. Switching over to the cell mediated side with the cytotoxic T cells. Again, we see the cyto the uh, the cytotoxic T cells here can be directly activated by an infected cell, or they can also be activated, again, by the helper T cells. And we see a couple of different forms of communication here. Again, just like with the B cells, we see the direct cell contact through the MHC molecules, and we see a little bit of paracrine um, signaling there with the, uh, the molecules. And the cytotoxic T cell will kill the infected cell. And so this is a, a body cell which has the pathogen inside, which the cytotoxic T cell is causing, uh, is inducing apoptosis in, which is cellular death. Okay, so that's how cytotoxic T cells and B cells work together to get rid of the pathogens, right? The B cells, the humoral side, works on pathogens in the bloodstream. The cytotoxic uh, T cells, the cell mediated side, gets rid of pathogens inside of our cells. Uh, we also talked a good bit about the nervous system. Um, in terms of evolution of the nervous system, uh, the one big step here that's very important is the planarian, the flatworm. Remember, this is the first animal to show a head. So it's got a, this uh, beginnings of a brain. It's a very, very simple brain. It's just really just a collection of nerves which all communicate with each other. But it is the first animal to show this. Um, and it's also the first animal to show the bilateral symmetry, which allows animals to have a direction, have a forwards and a backwards and a right and a left hand side. Uh, basic functions of the nervous system. There is sensory input. That input gets sent into an integration center, which then coordinates a, an output to the motor cells. A basic example of that is a reflex arc. Right? Remember that reflex arcs work very, very quickly because for the most part, they do not have to travel up to the brain. Here we see the, the integration center for this particular reflex arc is in the spinal cord down in, in the lower back. So it does not have to go all the way up to the brain, coordinate a response and send the signal back down to the leg. It connects in the, the spinal cord and can respond much, much faster. The cells of the nervous system are neurons. And these neurons through the function of the sodium potassium pump have a membrane potential of about negative 70 millivolts and this is maintained by pumping all the sodium out of the cell and all the potassium into the cell. The function of the nervous system, uh, the way neurons work, is through modulating this membrane potential and this is called an action potential. So here we have the five basic steps of an action potential. I think it's very important that you understand what is going on at each of these steps. So at step one, this is the resting state. Uh, not shown in this picture are the sodium potassium pumps, which are working to create this uh, membrane potential by pumping three sodiums out of the cell and bringing two potassiums in. That causes the outside of the cell to be positive and the inside to be negative. Uh, the sodium and potassium channels here at the resting state are all closed. So the outside stays positive and the inside remains negative. When a cell begins to get a signal, a few of the sodium channels will open, which will allow sodium ions to come into the cell, which will depolarize the potential. It'll get the potential more towards neutral. 
once the potential, once that membrane potential reaches the threshold, uh, the sodium channels will all begin to open. And once all of these sodium channels are open, then so much sodium comes in that the membrane potential actually flips. So here we see that the inside of the cell is now positive and the outside is negative. And this is the action potential. This is the neuron firing and passing along its information. Uh, step four then is getting back to the resting state. So now the neuron has done its job. It sent its signal along. The sodium channels are all closing here. And now the potassium channels are opening, allowing potassium to flow out of the cell down its gradient. And that gets us back to our resting state, the cell being positive on the outside and negative on the inside. The final step, step five, uh, this little undershoot is very important because this is what's called the refractory period. This is a sh very short period of time where the neuron is unable to respond to any stimulus. Until the potential comes back up to resting potential, the, uh, the neuron is unable to fire. And this is very important in keeping the information transfer in one direction down the, uh, the axon of the neuron. Okay, organs of the nervous system. Uh, this is the central nervous system. Uh, mainly the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, structures of the brain, uh, knowing the four lobes of the brain is probably fairly important. Uh, I don't think you would have to know specific functions that are located there, um, other than just remembering that certain brain functions are mapped to very specific locations. Peripheral nervous system side, uh, there's a few different branches here. Uh, the somatic nervous system, that controls our skeletal muscles, and that's all of our voluntary movements. And then the autonomic nervous system is all of our involuntary movements. Um, the enteric division controls the digestive system. And then the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions control the fight and flight response or the rest and digest response. Um, the sympathetic division, that is the fight or flight response, that gets the body ready to respond, ready for physical action. Uh, the parasympathetic division, that is the rest and digest response, that brings us back down and calms us down. Uh, I, knowing details about this, certainly probably not terribly important. Um, just kind of remember what happens when you're under stress, when you're excited, that's the sympathetic division. Um, the way you feel when that stress is passed, that is the parasympathetic division acting. And they basically, if you look at all the activities, uh, they are pretty much the opposite. Last thing we're going to talk about are the motor and muscular systems in animals. Um, skeletal system, not terribly important for the AP test. Uh, just know that there, there are bones in our bodies. Uh, the muscles work by pulling on these bones. Remember that muscles can only pull. They exert their force by contracting. Uh, in order to move our body in opposite directions, our muscles work in pairs to pull on our body, on, on our skeleton, and move our limbs around in opposite directions. Okay, muscles can only pull. They cannot push. Okay, structurally, uh, the muscles are made up of uh, these muscle fibers, which contain these myofibrils, which are made up of sarcomeres. All that is probably not terribly important to know what all of these little tiny structures are, um, besides the thick filaments and the thin filaments found within the sarcomere. And the way that a muscle contracts is to make that sarcomere length shorter by sliding the thick and thin filaments across each other. Okay, this is called the sliding filament model of muscle contraction. So the thick filaments are made up of a protein called myosin, and the thin filaments are made up of actin. Uh, the way that the muscle contracts is the myosin heads there will reach up when they have a when ATP is cleaved to ADP and 
an inorganic phosphate that releases the energy. The myosin then goes into the high energy configuration and the myosin head then grabs on to the actin and as it relaxes back to the low energy state, it pulls the actin along. So the actual lengths of the fibers, the thin, fi thin filament and the thick filament, don't change. The fibers stay the same length, but they slide past each other. And that pulls the sarcomere and makes it shorter. And that is the way that muscles contract. Um, there is another regulatory level on top of this that involves calcium okay wrapped around the thin filaments of actin there are these two proteins uh, troponin and tropomyosin the troponin binds to uh, calcium ions and when calcium comes in that moves the tropomyosin out of the way and a uncovers the myosin binding sites on the actin filaments so myosin can now reach up grab the actin and contract the muscle so this calcium is stored in the muscle in an area called the sarcoplasmic reticulum the sr so this calcium is released when a motor neuron contacts the muscle cell and tells the muscle hey it's time to contract so the signal is received on the cell surface and that signal transduction pathways travel down into the cell, into the SR. The calcium is released. Calcium binds to the troponin complex and the muscle is able to contract. Okay, so that is communication and I hope that that was clear. Galileo dropped the orange.